Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Yuwot. It's Wednesday, September 22nd. This is Africa 54. At least five people are dead and 50 injured following a string of attacks in Burundi. How Zambia is bridging the gap in hearing care. And in Malawi, an intelligent tap provides water to rural communities. We begin our broadcast in the small landlocked country of Burundi where at least two people are dead and 50 others were wounded in the latest string of attacks to hit the East African nation. David Doyle has more. Burundi's Prime Minister on Tuesday visited the victims of the latest in a string of attacks. Two grenades exploded at a bus parking lot in biggest city Bujumbura the day before. A third blast hit a market. At least two people were killed and many more injured, according to Prime Minister Alain Guillaume Bunyoni. The total, among others, hit by the shrapnel amounts to 104 people, while two among those 104 succumbed to their injuries. More than 50 wounded got treated and discharged and were able to return to their households. Burundi's interior ministry says unidentified terrorists are to blame. There was no claim of responsibility. It's also not clear who was responsible for another grenade attack on Sunday. It took place in the administrative capital, Gitega, local media reported, resulting in two deaths. However, Congo-based rebel group Red Tabara says it carried out an attack using mortars on the airport in Bujumbura on Saturday. The group was formed a decade ago with the aim of overthrowing the government, which it says does not respect the rule of law. Burundians accused of having ties to the group have been tortured and likely disappeared, Human Rights Watch said in a report on Friday. Unidentified bodies have been found in the river separating Burundi from Congo, HRW added. The East African country has suffered decades of ethnic and political bloodletting. The United Nations says the youth wing of the political party and the security services are complicit in torture, gang rape and murder of political opponents. The government denies the charges. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is calling for a comprehensive, balanced and legally binding agreement on the operation of a giant hydropower dam on the Blue Nile in Ethiopia. In a recorded statement to the United Nations General Assembly, Sisi said the Nile is Egypt's lifeline, which explains the extreme anguish that Egypt feels over the Renaissance Dam. Egypt and Sudan are both calling on the UN Security Council to resume African Union-led talks to help resolve the dispute after Ethiopia began filling the reservoir behind its Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in July for a second year. Ethiopia is opposed to any United Nations-led involvement. World leaders meeting at the UN General Assembly are turning their attention Wednesday to the 20th anniversary of the Durban Declaration on Eliminating Racism, a hot topic that has raised controversy in some quarters. For more insight, let's go live to the United Nations in New York, where VOA UN correspondent Margaret Bishir is following the discussions. Hello, Margaret. Hi, good to be with you. Bring us up to speed on how this discussion has gone on so far. So it's the 20th anniversary of the South African conference in Durban that addressed uh, this issue of racism. And uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations said it's a time for reflection on where 
uh, we've been and where we're headed and uh, uh, you know, time to take stock. We heard from African uh, leaders. We heard from uh, Felix uh, Tshisekedi, who's the head of the African Union right now. And he said that the African members uh, support reparations for slavery and colonialism. And he also urged countries to cancel debt. And uh, we heard a video message from President Ramaphosa from South Africa. Uh, he spoke about um, being committed to anti-discrimination agenda and ending racism internationally, basically. I mean, it's a global move. Margaret, and a number of key countries have boycotted this Durban 4 conference. Why has it raised so much controversy? Yeah, about two dozen countries, mostly European and the United States, uh, have uh, boycotted it at Israel's uh, request. Uh, Israel doesn't like this conference. They say it's anti-Semitic, it's anti-Israel. They don't like it because in 2001 there was a move to label Israel as an, anti uh, as an apartheid state because of their treatment of the Palestinian people. So it's a sore topic with them. On Sunday, uh, the Israeli ambassador to the UN held held a side event of his own that drew former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and it was sort of a counter event uh, to counter the Durban conference. Margaret, moving on to uh, the island nation of Madagascar, there's reported acute uh, malnutrition as well as famine. What do, does the world body plan to do to save lives in that country? Right, so Madagascar has been on the UN radar for quite a while now. Its uh, famine is descending on the country. Uh, more than a million people are marching towards starvation, according to the World Food Program. Today, uh, President Rajolina spoke here in New York at the UN. He said his country is affected by climate change, even though uh, the people of Madagascar have done very little to contribute to it. And uh, he said that they've been having terrible uh, droughts, you know, they were uh, uh, affected by this great locust swarms that have been affecting East Africa this year. Their water sources are drying up. The, it's almost impossible now for them to plant and to keep livestock alive. Um, so uh, President Rajalina urged countries to put their money where their mouth is on solidarity and especially in mitigating climate change. And he said his government isn't just waiting for everyone else to help. They're taking strategic action, and one of the projects they're working on right now is building a water pipeline that goes from the north of the island to the south to try and bring water to irrigate uh, crops in that drought-affected area. Uh, crops in that drought-affected area. Hopefully, they get the help they need soon. Margaret, thank you well, so much. Well, they need much. it soon. Yes, thank you so much, Margaret, for your excellent reporting. VOA UN correspondent Margaret Bashir reporting live from New York. Please join us on Africa 54 Thursday when Margaret brings us another live report from the United Nations. At the 76th United Nations General Assembly, U.S. President Joe Biden called on world leaders to unite against threats confronting the world today, including the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis. However, he is facing an uphill battle to convince allies that America is back and ready to lead the fight. VOA White House Bureau Chief Patsy Widakuswara has more. In his first address to the United Nations General Assembly, U.S. President Joe Biden declared his administration ready to help the world tackle global challenges. Ending this pandemic, addressing the climate crisis, managing the shifts in global power dynamics, shaping the rules of the world on vital issues like trade, cyber, and emerging technologies, and facing the threat of terrorism as it stands today. Recognizing rising U.S. tensions with China and Russia, Biden said major powers must manage relationships and avoid conflict. The United States is ready to work with any nation that steps up and pursues peaceful resolution to shared challenges, even if we have intense disagreements in other areas, because we'll all suffer the consequences of our failure. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres also urged immediate action. COVID and the climate crisis have exposed profound fragilities as societies and as a planet. Yet instead of humility in the face of these epic challenges, we see hubris. Instead of the path of solidarity, we are on a dead end to destruction. 
Biden promised to boost funding up to $11.4 billion to help developing nations cope with the ravages of climate change and build greener economies. Some are skeptical of his commitment. The U.S. also has a history of making fairly large pledges of, internet, of support for international climate finance, but missing them when it comes to actually sending the money. Still, Biden's speech is a departure from his predecessor's rejection of multilateralism and globalism. But he faces an uphill battle convincing allies that America is back and ready to lead. The fiasco uh, that took place in Afghanistan over the last uh, few weeks of the withdrawal certainly caused a lot of alarm uh, in many key capitals. And I think that um, President Biden needs to use global forums like the UNGA meetings to try to send a very important message to the world, including NATO partners and uh, treaty allies in, in Asia, that um, despite what may have happened in Afghanistan, the U.S. remains committed to its allies and its partners. Despite the chaotic withdrawal, Biden framed the U.S. exit from Afghanistan as an end to relentless war and the beginning of a new era of relentless diplomacy. But on the diplomatic front, Biden is already dealing with French anger over the recent U.S. and U.K. announcement to provide nuclear-powered submarines to Australia, which scuttled President Emmanuel Macron's conventional submarine deal. While freight relations need to be repaired, analysts say it's unlikely to have long-term impact. The bigger issue with U.S. credibility is whether or not the United States can continue to signal that it's willing to kind of provide global public goods of security, of economic aid um, to its allies and partners, and, and when necessary, to, to, to work with the rest of the globe. That opportunity will come Wednesday when Biden convenes a virtual COVID-19 summit to rally world leaders to recommit in the fight against the pandemic. Pat Siwida Huswara, VOA News. President Biden also called on the international community to advocate for the rights of women and girls around the world. He praised the champions of democracy, including the youth of Zambia, who recently came out in large numbers to elect a new president, and women of Sudan, who helped topple the dictatorial regime of Omar al-Bashir. South Sudanese Vice President Rebecca Nyadeng de Mabiol stopped in Washington on her way to New York to attend the United Nations General Assembly. In an interview with VOA's Nabil Biagio, de Mabiol talked about her country's challenge in creating a unified and well-trained military. One of the things that UN is not happy is uh, we have not graduated the uh, unified forces. And now if we are, we are going to graduate unif uh, unified forces, uh, about 53,000, we are going to graduate them with sticks. And then you just send them to the community. They will not go to the barracks. What control the soldier is his gun or her gun. So if, if the arm embargo is there, how do you expect us to arm those people that are telling us to graduate? President Salfa said that in his speech when he was opening the parliament, that we are graduating 53,000 unified forces. And then now we, we say that let us go ahead doing that, but we will ask for arm embargo or any other way that UN wanted us to arm this group so that they can start protecting the civilian. For example, uh, I was one of the opposition. Uh, there were a lot of difficulties before, like for example the unknown gunmen and all these things. They are not there anymore. If you go to Juba now, uh, the economics indications are showing. Uh, the IMF have helped us, so now we have balanced the, the, the exchange rate uh, from the, the uh, central bank and the market. Uh, it is 41, 41. So it, has, it is improving the economy. Now also National Revenue Authority are doing very well. They have digitalized the, the system, the payment system. Uh, they have also removed the roadblocks which was increasing the prices in the market. Vice President Emma Bio also addressed the ongoing efforts towards attaining gender equity in South Sudan's public institutions. In my office together with, uh, with other offices like the Ministry of Gender, uh, Child and Social Welfare, and the Parliament was just uh, was inaugurated, but uh, together we are working to see into it that 
the representation of women are realized. There are some problems, yes, uh, like for example in the executive, the percentage is 26%, and it was supposed to be 35%. And, uh, and, and also in the parliament, but in the parliament is much better than in the executive. If you come to the presidency, at least this percentage in the presidency is okay because it is a place that we are not rich in. And we are not quiet, we, we are talking so that uh, what, what was not met in the other areas should be met in the other areas. So uh, I know that there, there are this problem, but the most important for us now is for our children to be secure because the women are the one carrying the brunt of everything. They are, hus they are losing their husband, they are losing their children. So the most important now in their agenda is to see peace coming to the country. Once peace comes, anything, you can say anything in your own country or under the, the tree wherever you are. But now we cannot, we are not secure until the security comes. That was South Sudanese Vice President Rebecca Nyadeng Demabio speaking with VOA's Nabil Biajo. And he is President Biden on uh, the rights of women and girls around the world. Let's take a listen. We all must advocate for women, the rights of women and girls, to use their full talents to contribute economically, politically, and socially and pursue their dreams free of violence and intimidation. From Central America to the Middle East, to Africa, to Afghanistan, wherever it appears in the world. We almost call out and condemn the targeting and oppression of racial, ethnic, and religious minorities when it occurs in, whether it occurs in Xinjiang, or Northern Ethiopia, or anywhere in the world. We all must defend the rights of LGBTQI individuals so they can live and love openly without fear, whether it's Chechnya or Cameroon or anywhere. As we steer our, steer our nations toward this inflection point and work to meet today's fast-moving, cross-cutting challenges, let me be clear. I am not agnostic about the future we want for the world. The future will belong to those who embrace human dignity, not trample it. The future will belong to those who unleash the potential of their people, not those who stifle it. The future will belong to those who give their people the ability to breathe free, not those who seek to suffocate their people with an iron hand. Authoritarianism, the authoritarianism of the world, may seek to proclaim the end of the age of democracy, but they're wrong. The truth is, the democratic world is everywhere. It lives in the anti-corruption activists, the human rights defenders, the journalists, the peace protesters. On the front lines of this struggle in Belarus, Burma, Syria, Cuba, Venezuela, and everywhere in between, it lives in the brave women of Sudan who withstood violence and oppression to push a genocidal dictator from power and who keep working every day to defend their democratic progress. It lives in the proud Moldovans who help deliver a landslide victory for the forces of democracy with a mandate to fight graft, to build a more inclusive economy. It lives in the young people of Zambia who harness the power of their vote for the first time, turning out in record numbers to denounce corruption and chart a new path for their country. And while no democracy is perfect, including the United States, we'll continue to struggle to live up to the highest ideals to heal our divisions. And we face down violence and insurrection. Democracy remains the best tool we have to unleash our full human potential. Tell us what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a new cutting-edge technology brings a sigh of relief to many households in Malawi. But first, Heidi Adams tells us what's in, on tap today on Straight Talk Africa. <laughs> On the next Straight Talk Africa, 
We'll take a look at terrorism hotspots on the continent and discuss what's at stake. We will look at how young people are being recruited by terrorist organizations and what governments can do to stop it. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. In Zambia, there are just five ear, nose and throat specialists and one audiologist for a country of 17 million people. However, a government plan is correcting this situation and has trained more than 200 nurses, clinical officers and community health workers. Clara Frank has our report. Alice knew there was something wrong when her three-year-old started crying if anyone touched her ears. She went to get help. But in rural Zambia, where Alice and her daughter Memory live, the options could have been limited. The country of 17 million people has just five ear, nose and throat specialists and one audiologist. But through a government plan based on World Health Organization ear and hearing care manuals, more than 200 nurses, clinical officers and community health workers have been trained over the past 18 months. And Alice was able to find help for her child. I wanted to go find medicine. That's when I was told that there's a nurse in Pula who is working on ears. Without hesitation, I went to the clinic. That's how she checked her up, found her with ear problems and gave her medicine. Memory was seen by Nurse Carol Sinkede. So the child had uh, a, a perforation in the uh, left ear, but ever since I've started seeing this child, I've noticed that the perforation has gone down due to the medication that uh, we are giving, which is an indication that the, actu the child is actually getting better and getting well. Since completing her training, Sinkende has helped over 600 patients with screenings and treatments. Before then, members of the rural community had to travel to the nearest city. The training has been provided under the government's national ENT strategic plan in response to a World Health Assembly resolution on preventing deafness and hearing loss. The WHO says one in five people worldwide live with hearing loss. Nearly 80 percent of them are in countries lacking adequate ear and hearing care services. Clara Frank, VOA News. Access to safe drinking water is a challenge for people all over the world. However, in Malawi, a new cutting-edge technology dubbed Intelligent Tap or ITAP brings a sigh of relief to many households. People in the rural communities use automated teller machines, ATM cards, to get water from water kiosks. Africa 54 technology correspondent Paul Ndiho spoke to Mayakon Nkolom, an innovator and managing director of Emosis, the company behind ITAP in Malawi. My name is Koloma. Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much. A lot of uh, people talk about uh, your initiative uh, trying to bring water to the rural areas as a life-saving uh, initiative. Uh, you've uh, had a lot of impact on the ground, especially in Malawi where you are. Tell us a little bit uh, more about what you've been able to do. I'm a CEO of uh, uh, a tech startup company in Malawi uh, called Imosis. Um, unlike other ICT companies, uh, we've had a huge uh, impact in Malawi. As you understand, uh, Malawi is one of the least developed countries and uh, mainly when you talk about technology, it is seen as more like an accessory. So what we've done is uh, we have uh, twisted the way how we are applying technology, uh, but now it is seen as a way of how it can assist in the development of the country. But one of the things that uh, I would discuss, which has been impactful, is the, through the use of uh, automated kioskis, uh, which we have developed and they have been adopted in the rural areas. So what we've done is uh, we have automated it. We have made it more like uh, an ATM, the way you draw money from an ATM. But now in this case, instead of money coming out, it is water that comes out. So this is what we have uh, initiated in our rural areas in Malawi. So people can go anytime whenever they want to get water. 
and uh, they just use a card which is loaded with the credit, tap and select the amount of water which they, they want. So they have access to clean water any time during the day because it's also powered by solar. So even at night, because in rural areas there's no electricity. So even at night, during the day, they have access to, to clean water, which is also crucial when it comes to fight against the uh, uh, COVID-19. You just brought up a very interesting uh, point. Uh, you talked about how you've been able to uh, build uh, water kiosks across the country, and uh, you are literally helping hundreds access water via uh, your smart solutions. Uh, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, it was a case concept which uh, they have been trying to do, but they failed uh, to handle it. And when we tap the need uh, for their operations, we tried to come up with a prototype, which we gave it to them, and it worked. And then later on, we got into a contract whereby they are able to uh, give us uh, opportunity to uh, make these units across the peri-urban areas within the catchment area, uh, which they supply water. Uh, you talked about uh, the idea of uh, literally showing up at an ATM, but instead of getting money, you get water. Is this a free service? Uh, because you also talked about how you are reaching uh, the, uh, the most rural areas uh, in Malawi. Uh, how are people able to, to do that when uh, maybe their financial circumstances are different? So currently, even using the manual technique, these people, when they go to these kioskis uh, using the manual way, they were still paying for the, for the water. Because this water is cleaned, it has been treated, it has been pumped from somewhere far to these rural areas. So the water utility company still needs to get a little bit something so that uh, it can assist them in managing the, the systems. With the problem of uh, manual solution, if there is a person there collecting money, there is no accountability. Chances that that money will end in someone's pocket is high. It may not go into the owners of the water. So having that system, it has cut off all these uh, corrupt practices. You know, someone might come, ah, this is my girlfriend, this is my mother, this is my friend. You know, they will just say, okay, get water, off you go. But, you know, that little scent that can be contributed by uh, these uh, people is important for continuity of the project and also to ensure that these people have access to clean water, water running uh, in their communities by contributing a little something. And that money could go into the sustainability of the, of the project. When the pipe is broken, uh, they have to call for a plumber. How will they